Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate. As usual, The Advocates are diagnosing problems as well as proffering solutions. This week, we're pointing to truths right under our noses. Ruki is back to state that women have a right to choose. Oh, before Uncle. Libera says it's not rocket science that absolute power is a function of holding both the yam and the knife. Interesting. Malahon's advocacy also speaks of greed, the proliferation of unoccupied mansions in a land of poverty. Incredible. Ekene says it's simpler that we have made it and that success is a winning brand. Simple, really. Whereas I'm saying the NBC should get real and not embark on a fool's errand. Direct enough for you? Although we are visionary in our advocacies, we're also realists. And it's time for a reality check after the break. Setting out with an unrealistic goal is as good as a failed mission. I'm going to be talking about the NBC's sixth code and the challenge to digital democracy. The NBC has included in its sixth code the task of regulating broadcasting on the internet. <laughs> really? Regulating terrestrial broadcasting is enough a challenge for the NBC, coupled with delivering on the digital switchover promise without taking on the humongous burden of regulating broadcasting on the internet. Recall that the Advertising Practitioners Council of Nigeria, APCON, had experimented with making internet users pay for adverts created and distributed online to the agency in the recent past. And they've seen how utterly ambitious it is. The NBC now toes the same path with this policy, when it glaringly lacks the manpower to embark on this increasingly controversial decision. I see this new policy as a deliberate attempt to frustrate digital inclusion and diversity. This policy undermines the contributions of an army of young Nigerians who have turned to the internet to actualize their dreams in broadcasting. These Nigerians, old and young, new entrants in the media and professionals who have years of practice under their belts, have turned to social media platforms to showcase their talents and distribute their work. They're creating and distributing content which are getting noticed by the masses and specialized sectors. And this recognition is bringing them social, cultural, material, and financial capital. And in turn, it's providing both pseudo employment and employment for thousands of unemployed Nigerians. And then those who lack the financial wherewithal to place programs on traditional radio and TV are falling back on mobile devices to share their productions. We have seen share ingenuity since the COVID-inspired lockdown in Nigeria. And but for the activities of citizens on social media, many would not have survived the pandemic thus far. And that's so true. Edison Research and Triton Digital Statistics in its 2019 annual social media study says women constitute the largest users of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Many women are able to use social media to sell their startup businesses and services to their friends, their families. MBC's latest move would essentially destroy the access to these gender-friendly platforms for women and again, it was stifle creativity, content creation and distribution, and please, press freedom as well. 
This policy is anti-people, it is inimical to the growth of the creative industry and catastrophic for young creatives who have found outlets on the internet for their creative ideas. I think it is foolhardy, an exercise in futility and a waste of energy. The NBC, I think, should rather reinvent its duties in the broadcast industry to reflect the realities and the demands of this digital age. It should redirect its efforts at ensuring quality content and sanity on Nigerian airways. It should invest in skilled manpower and state-of-the-art equipment to effectively monitor, and that's the, the bulk of what they should be doing. It should mandate local broadcasters to produce relatable and competing content with the offerings on cable TV stations operating in the country. The broad broadcast regulator should save the nation the embarrassment of tuning to cable TV operators to even enjoy clear signals from our terrestrial TV and radio stations. And we need compelling programs on our local TV and radio stations. It should, NBC should indigenize and contextualize policies copied from abroad to reflect our peculiar challenges. Responsible and responsive media governance starts from here for both NBC as a regulator and its supervising ministry. Thank you so much for that. I'll just say that very quickly. I'm sure um, Ruki and uh, Bola have a lot to say as well. But um, thank you for that, for collating that. Um, what you need to ask, what I keep asking in my mind is why do people prioritize regulation? I used to always, for the longest time, I thought NBC's main task was to rein, you know, regulate. I've worked in compliance abroad, and I know that a lot of times the issues they raise in compliance have to do with what the general public are raising. They're responding to what the general, they're not by themselves going out to be the watchdog. You know, right. they're responding to, so, you know, when I was in compliance, for example, you had letters coming in, you collate them, you know, you put all the ones in different categories. If something was flagged up several times, then you addressed it. This is with the BBC. So now you're looking at NBC and they're prioritizing, you know, essentially going after what they feel is dangerous use of whatever online. I would like to see why. And the current NBC DG, I've, I've sort of listened to him and I feel he has what makes me concerned. He has a concerning, do you say, do you, he's, he's biased against, to me, free speech. That's what I think. He seems to be towing the line of the government. And we have all said in times past that we're not happy with this anti-free speech, hate speech bills and social media bills. So why are they prioritizing this? They're not doing what they ought to be doing. So I, I support you in that sense. It's beginning I'm saying, to look like that's you're, you're what you're not saying, to providing an enabling the environment, then you're stifling free speech. So exactly. it really doesn't make me very happy. And I think I'm glad you've raised this. I think we need to be watching them as well as holding, yeah. you know, are find you, a way of getting behind uh, and holding I, them accountable. Yes. The issue is simple. Um, here, when you work in, um, you know, as a regulator, especially in most of these government regulatory agencies, you see yourself as government. You don't, oh, really? um, yes, yes. You I don't say this. identify you don't, with the people. You don't need to identify with the people. You don't owe the people you, any. Yes, you act, the legions you so act well. as, you know, an extension of, you know, the president, the minister. And so you become a mouthpiece rather than even regulating government itself. Okay. And, and so that's why it is the same mentality that, you know, that government, um, you know, elected officials have here. And that's the same mentality you see the uh, regulators as a bit. But they forget that, like you said, as a regulator, you are supposed to gauge the feel of the public. What are those things that, you know, ought to be regulated? What are those other things that People we are, are not doing by, well? Yeah. yeah. So you take on those things, understand them as a regulator, look at them from a professional point of view, and then find a way of either answering or regulating. But here, somebody just sits down and brings up an idea. And then the next question is, how do we make money from it? Wow. Oh, so the, the driving force, first and foremost, is money. And can we make money from control, this? People. And control, which is even more yeah. sinister. And, and so, okay, we forget the second one of control. The first one is money. Okay. And, and so if it will bring money to them, and then because government also wants to achieve, like you said, maybe control, and then, and then you now begin to ask yourself, like Rookie, um, sorry, Treasure had yes. asked, you don't even have the capacity to monitor your local Which, TV stations okay, and regulate them. The yeah. Now you want to go to the internet where it is almost an impossibility for you. I'm wondering how you don't even it. have the wherewithal, the, the the equipment to do that. And then the saddest part is that when these regulations are put in place, there is a targeted 
audience or market that they want to regulate. Mind yes. is not everybody. Uh, that's what came so they mind. use that code to target them. To target them, and then you, you know that's all. Hmm. Pat's Golaho will have something to say, and and, and we can. Uh, rookie. Okay, so let me jump in here. You know, you just mentioned something very pertinent to me. You talked about the people using the social media platform. You talked about women and young yes. people. Yeah, yeah. So the older generation can compete in this environment. And if you really look at Nigeria, some businessman that come on the other day, I forgot, I think he was the owner of a bank. He had said that, why are young people not um, leading? Why are they not in politics? Why are they not governors? The average is 60 or 70, 80. These are our presidents because they have totally snuffed that whole environment so that young people can compete. They don't have the money, they don't have godfathers and things like that. And so this is the only place people can come and excel and get noticed and, and really, you know, bring their talents out, whether it's Nollywood or new music or, you know, new, new um, innovations that they're working on, even shooting um, productions. So my concern is the older generation who are the government are now taking all the juicy spots so you can find, barely find a young 40-year-old or 30-year-old um, president in Nigeria, that's a dream, or even a woman, you know, being, being a senator, how many of them? Then you want to come into where they're thriving to regulate them further so they cannot do what they need to do. I think that's really concerning. Obviously, there's a conflict of interest when you are um, the government and the same people are um, appointing all these heads of uh, NBC and all this, so they have to answer to their bosses and okay. so for me, it's a very difficult um, area to to support. I, there's no way I can support that. How do we regulate and, the MBC? And, well, Let's quickly sure. hear we from have... Bola Hon. Let's yeah. quickly hear from Bola Hon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This looks to me like a backdoor attempt to smuggle in elements of uh, either the hate speech bill or the social media bill, whatever you want to call it, in a way. And I, I also like the last paragraph particularly, uh, because he was talking about how we need to um, adapt some of the current program. You, you, you get on the media, and 75% of what you're consuming are foreign, without elements of, um, uh, of adaptation to the local environment. I think there's a lot of work to be space. So NBC should rather be driving things like a, a, a robust content. Honestly, I, I would want to follow up on this thing in the future. I know we're not, we don't have enough time to say, yeah. how do we regulate these regulatory bodies so that they represent <laughs> us? Yeah, they need to Regulating represent us. Regulating the regulatory watches, body. That's the exit over the water. point. Yes. We've been saying that failure is a function of wrong objectives. After the break, Rookie points to a fundamental flaw in society's outlook. What has been given can technically not be taken away. A woman's right to choose. Does a woman have a right to choose to have an abortion? Abortion is, is not a modern aberration, but a practice common to human com communities throughout history. Indeed, abortion has been used throughout the world for thousands of years as a way of ending a wanted pregnancy. Historically, early abortion was tolerated by the Catholic Church and um, for centuries, it was not punished under English common law, which has the greatest historical influence on our own Nigerian legal system. This first authoritative collection of canon law accepted by the Catholic Church in the 1140 AD contained the conclusion that early abortion was not homicide. Also, Pope Innocent III had written at the beginning of the 13th century, that quickening was the moment at which abortion became homicide, and that prior to that, it was less a serious sin. The abortion policy of the Catholic Church continued until 1869, when Pope Pius IX officially eliminated the distinction between an animated and a non-animated fetus, and required excommunication for abortions at that stage of at any stage of pregnancy. Recently, Pope Francis said that abortion is not a religious problem in the sense that just because you're a Catholic, you must not seek an abortion. Rather, he said it was a human problem, a problem of eliminating a human life, period. Human or religious? An irony? Maybe not. Posterity would perhaps judge him as the most humane of all popes before him. We'll see. 
On January 22nd, 1973, the United States Supreme Court issued a 7-2 decision announcing a landmark ruling that legalized abortion. I'm sure you've all heard of Roe versus Wade and Doe versus Bolton, where the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excessive government restriction. Few in 1973 could have anticipated how explosive the issue of abortion would actually become, nor could anyone have known how much the availability of safe legal abortion would contribute to women's social, economic, political advancement for the next quarter of a century. Certainly even in the year 2020, these are still relevant issues. In Nigeria, Abortion is legal only when performed to save a woman's life. Can you imagine that? Yet, abortions are very common and most are unsafe because they are still done clandestinely by unskilled providers or by both. So see, unsafe abortion is a major contribution contributor to our country's high levels of maternal death, ill health and disability. Nigeria still has one of the highest maternal mortality ratios in the world today. Contraception in Nigeria is still very low in uptake. Less than 17% of sexually active women in Nigeria, due to varying factors, actually use contraception. So some use abortions as a means of con contraception and will still be in demand to the foreseeable future. So why not change our laws to make it safe? In 2020, in Canada, where I'm currently residing, abortion is legal at all stages of pregnancy, funded in part by the Canada Health Act. While some non-legal barriers to access continue to exist, such as lacking equal access to providers, I'm very proud to inform you that Canada is the only nation with absolutely no specific legal restrictions to abortion at any stage for any reason. A woman demands abortion, she gets it today. Now, I'm a Catholic, a physician, I'm female, obviously, and um, I'm also a politician. So I'm supposed I'm right in the middle of the center of this um, this hot topic, this debate. So does a woman have the right to choose to have an abortion in the first, second, or third trimester of pregnancy? I'm sure we all saw the gruesome video that circulated recently in, in social media, where a young lady in police custody just calmly described how she murdered her infant by drowning her in a bucket of water because of the shame, the stigma, of an unwanted pregnancy and the rejection from society and attendant disruption of her education. She expressed her regret of not going through with an abortion because her sister persuaded her um, to keep the baby. Now, which is worse, the abortion or the murder? How can we measure one's preparedness mentally, physically, as a human being, much less a pregnant young one? My book is it therefore, is for whatever reason, or whenever during a pregnancy a woman decides to have an abortion, it is a right to choose, and it's only her right to choose that abortion. Uh, considering the story that um, you narrated, the issue with that uh, um, young lady and uh, also that is common amongst our young lady is not the right to abortion. Is the stigma and the fact that there are no right no um, education awareness on you know pregnancy and no care you know for little children and so the stigma the rejection that's what made her that's what even pushed some people to say I want to have an abortion but if they know if they are well um, received and the, the education in that aspect the parental care and education it's there and in some cases also by government, um, would have moved far, would take a step also. I, I also wanted to include that in your advocacy, that there is need for parental care and um, acceptance. So that the fact that a young lady is pregnant does not mean that her life has you know, ended, or that does not mean that uh, she has ended her career or academics. I have some, some classmates who you know, became pregnant while we were in the university, um, some even in secondary school, and but because their parents, you know, received them and you know, supported, them. supported them. Today, some of us who didn't have, you know, who who were upright, some of us are regretting. In retrospect, you look at those children today. Some are grandparents. Recently, a, a friend of mine, he had a child while we were in um, class three or four. You know, he rejected it, but the woman, the, the mother, said no. 
This is our child. This is our daughter. And recently, he came to my house with this same young baby then. I said, ah, where did you see this girlfriend? He said, no, this is my daughter now. She's getting married. I came yeah. to invite you yeah, for a wedding. Imagine. You know, and I felt like, oh, if I had known, I probably would have. You know, so <laughs> when, you, when you encourage such parental support. support, you know, you probably also would have reduced this Ill illegal um, um, abortion. abortion. Let, so let me jo jump in there because I have a similar. You recall that the first time I came on the advocates, I talked about of pregnancies when 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 school children, school girls have are pregnant, and then you stop them from yes, going I continue with their schooling, and then you allow the boy, yeah, if it's a, if it's a yeah, girl, yeah, to continue with schooling. It's still the same thing about the shame and stigma. Yeah. It's there in the society. Once you get pregnant as a young person, your if whether young or no not, support, there yeah. is no support. There's this stigma. There's this shame associated with it. And then getting an abortion is like, oh, you can't do it in a proper hospital. So you have mm. to be clandestine about it. You have to do it under the table. And then that's how our girls get exposed. Infertility issues arise, infection, and all what have you. Some of them die. And then some of them, it affects them when they then get pregnant again and they want to have their babies. Is that they die or they lose the baby because something has gone wrong back then. So as my, my, my advice, my advocacy will be to the society. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we should just mean, stop all this shaming yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting um, no. advocacy because it brings up so many issues. And I'm not it's sure, like it. what Libros and Treasure are saying, abortion necessarily deals with all the myriad of layers yeah. beneath. But I yeah. also want to now ask, because when I, when I heard your advocacy, I was saying to myself, what is the law for? Is the law just to regulate or is the law also to uh, safeguard some of the moral codes by which we live our lives? And exactly. that's where I want to weigh in. I, yeah. would, I would say that a baby is viable even before, even from, what, once, yeah, once, so, so you're taking like, <coughs> from but I, conception. I, I, I know that it's, it's wrong, even when you say that, left to me, no baby should be aborted. No you know, baby I'm should coming, be I'm aborted. I'm coming, let me get in we there, let me land the ball. I'm coming, no, no, very quickly. So, sorry, Bola House, okay, um, very quickly, because so, I haven't even made my point. So no baby should be aborted, but when you look at that, you don't want people to become hypocrites as well, yeah. and now start doing clandestine like you're saying. So I would still say, let's educate, let's do everything side by side. Let's educate our people to understand the value of life. Let's educate our girls not to expose themselves to relationships whereby when the child comes into the world, they're not able to handle it. Let's educate the society so that you give the girls the support, even when they find themselves even, Give you know, the girls support. Yeah. For me, I, I think we also need to speak with the religious bodies. Um, because religion has a great role to play in how these issues are viewed and how we treat this, this situation and the girls that are involved. Um, as long as we are such a religious society, and this matters has implications from a religious perspective, we will never be able to address it totally without bringing in the buy-in and support of the religious leaders. We need to be able to know where to intervene, where to give the support. At the same time, why you dissuade it? You dissuade unwanted pregnancy. Rookie has pointed out a fundamental misorientation. I'll be saying more about how to get us back on track after the break. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Transparency is not rocket science, but the ability of the ordinary people to see clearly and distinctly through any process, thing or procedure, be it in government or outside of government, EFCC, ICPC, and transparency. That the Attorney General of the Federation, Abubakar Malemi, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, has called for the sacking of the Acting Chair of the Economic and Financial Crime Commission, EFCC, on grounds of diversion of recovered loot to insubordination, 
misconduct and about 22 other weighty allegations bordering on accounting discrepancies of figures of recovered assets and transparency in the management of same is no longer news. Recall that in early 2019, Maguwai flaunting the achievement of his three-year stewardship before journalists in Abuja, announced that the EFCC under his watch had recovered 794 billion naira, 261 million dollars, about, that's about 77.8 billion naira, that's 1.1 million pounds, and about 407 mansions from looters, oh boy. He also stated that the commission convicted no fewer than 700 and, 703 corrupt persons and institutions within the period under review. However, in a sharp twist, the then former Minister of Finance, Kemi Adeosho, by letter dated February 9, 2019, stated that her ministry was only able to account for 91.3 billion recovered loot lodged in the CBN account by the EFCC from 2015 to February 2019, and subsequently asked Magu for an explanation as to the discrepancies in figure. Was Magu overhyping his recovery, or did he just kept some for themselves? Again, even though the EFCC haven't given a new figure of loot recovered by them, distinct from the figure in 2019, the Attorney General of the Federation, Bubakam Malemi, in June 2020, accused the EFCC boss of lodging into recovering account with the CBN only 543 million naira of recovered loot, leaving a shortfall of 254 billion naira, sorry, billion before, from the 2019 figure. He also accused him of unauthorized sales of recovered fixed asset. The sound of this money can give one high blood pressure. In a country where people live on less than one dollar a day, God, God, where are you? Well, typical of our brand of politics, a group under the auspices of Canary Collective Agenda, and some northern leaders also called on the President Mohamed Buhari to sack the Attorney General for daring to call for the sack of Mago. Their request is hinged on the claim that such a call was an indirect indictment of the Buhari's administration. You remember, even the previous Senate had refused to confirm Mago on grounds of a damning security report from the Department of State's service, that's DSS citing lack of capacity and fitness to hold the office of the chair of EFCC. Is this a case of incompetence, that of the bushmaid becoming the hunter, or shared desperation by those whose hands are in the cookie jar, as my boy Jimmy Disu will say, being afraid of Magu exposing them sooner or later? Well, since the court, Koram Ijoma Ojuku J, had said the concern allows Magu to act in perpetuity, subject to Mr. President's discretion, we await the time. For Mr. President to unravel, you know, this. But be sure that this movie is far from being over. So grab your popcorn and drink. To reduce all of this quagmire and infighting, one would have expected as a way of consistent institutional strengthening, the same National Assembly would have by now amended the law setting up our anti graft agencies like EFCC and ICPC to be in tandem with global best practices and what is obtainable in countries that strive to achieve transparency, i.e., Separation of investigative agencies from the agencies that would recommend prosecution. Separation of prosecuting agencies from asset management. That way, you not only enhance transparency, probity, and accountability in the agencies, you also make money on management of recovered assets even before selling. And subsequently, also reduce the concentration of too many powers in one agency and avoid abuses such as the one complained of by Malemi and Adiosho. The FCC would also be devoid of indiscriminate use of powers of arrest and psychological torture to obtain evidence, fanned by pursuit of prosecutor, prosecutorial record and statistics chasing that's ticking the numbers. Because when such evidence violates the laid down procedural rules and, pro and processes, a thorough prosecutorial review agency will refuse prosecution and professionalism will be enhanced. I would therefore advocate that no matter how frivolous or vexatious these allegations against Magu are, I think the president should not turn a deaf ear to same, especially coming from his chief legal officer, and as a way of reposing confidence in his apostles and believers that this administration is still fighting corruption and not just mere chasing shadows. It is pertinent to appoint a renowned forensic auditor, auditors, please, not interim management committee, to audit the account of both the EFCC and ICPC, and make such report public. Also, the Office of the Attorney General should be questioned to ensure that their cry is not a cover-up. That way, the administration would not only have reiterated its position that nobody's above the law, 
but both parties and their supporters would have been assured of fairness and equity. Then and only then can we truly say we are building institutions that will leave us and not the physical building housing such agencies or commission. As a concentration of absolute power is in an agency in itself breeds corruption. If you hold both the yam and the knife, you will definitely cut a slice for yourself. Together, let's stop this yam slicing mentality. I was talking about um, the, 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 the laws. Um, at some point, the Senate had a problem, or the, the National Assembly had a problem with confirming Magu. And the law says that the president can keep him in acting capacity for as long as he so desires. So I would have thought, like a liberal said, that part of what will be the concern of the Senate is that we don't want to be in this kind of situation again. So that relevant law will have been amended to ensure that we don't keep someone in that capacity forever. But as you can see, nothing has happened in that direction, which means the intention might not exactly be as noble as the, the people really tend to make us believe. On the other side also is the fact that right from day one, I've asked myself about the issue of competence. We have uh, uh, um, a, a, a boss of the anti-corruption agency who is more focused on catching them after they have stolen. <laughs> we need to move our anti-corruption fight away from catching them after the money has left to a, pre, a prevention kind of a situation, make it difficult or nearly impossible for people to steal. Okay, let me come in that there. Would... Let me come in there on the prevention because my mind went to prevention, but not necessarily the prevention you just spoke of. I, I, because when Libra spoke, essentially what came to my mind is separation of powers. That, was, that uh -huh. seemed to be what he was presenting to us. But I said to myself, even where we have separation of powers in governance, are we even seeing it working? So the problem is still fundamentally with the people we're dealing with. They will find a way around it. So I say, let's take a step even behind that and say, how can we get the right people in? So we need to take away the money magnet that is at the heart of our governance so that these people who are going in there, because you don't blame, the, you don't blame these people, the thugs or whoever, that are so-called 419ers who are dr drawing near to governance because the attraction is too strong. Yeah. And someone said that if you govern for like four years, you've got more than enough to set yourself up for life. So why don't we take it away? Why don't we disincentivize um, those kind of people and make it more about service like they have in the UK. You have your job, but you're coming to serve. Because listening to someone like uh, the lady for COA, uh, Professor Shurnaya, recently, my heart bled that someone like that cannot get into governance. We need those kind of people who see governance as service, as a laying down of your life, so that we can then get you know, the kind of right people around governance that are not going to be, you're not going to be chasing them for money and mansions. Let me stop there. Well, for me, when I hear those mind-boggling figures, you know, those billions, the way Libras drops those billions, and I just go dizzy. Like, <laughs> how do people sleep it's at night? It's another world. Yeah, how do they sleep They're at night? They're not living with us. You know, <laughs> the yam and the, 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 the knife, knife mentality. Just, just helping yourself. Yeah, yeah. just helping. It's, it's exactly it's the buffy. word. Mm. Margot said he's convicted 703 corrupt persons and institutions. That, in, that alone is humongous. Mm. You mean seven, almost a thousand. And these are high profile. No, They're not just... How many of them are high profile? And even the Kemi Adioshu thing, as at last year, what did they do about it? All the way till now, we're still... How many of them are high? The high profile ones are, you know, barely see the... Rookie, of... you, you've had a right, taste of, of governance. Right. Why not tell us what it's like on the inside? Uh, for, it's, it's really, really very fascinating to me. Um, these people that you appoint to fight not not corruption as far as i see it your political enemies because once you switch to the other side seems like the cases all drop yeah and for me when you confiscate things that um are your friends if, if you will how how is that true and how when we see no prosecutions we see no jail time except you're on, in an opposing party so for me they're using the efcc the icpc to witch hunt i'm sure you all know what happened to uh, former senate um, senate president um, bukola saraki um, with his um, asset declaration form and all that court um, thing. And that's because he wasn't playing ball with the um, um, executive. And so I, I really, really believe that this is one institution that needs to be above the fray. And for sure, if they are even submitting figures that don't add up, which is already just crazy because you're meant to be fighting corruption and then you're the one actually perpetrating it. I really think this, that, that body doesn't even have any place in our society. And we need to find a way to have public 
input to appointing these people, not oh, just wow. executives. We need to That's find different. a way of making public input. Yeah. Yes, um, um, we need to find a way of um, making them accountable. We'll, we'll continue to... Yes. Um, why you also hold us accountable, we want to hold you accountable by hearing what you have to say. So we'll pause here to you, hear you speak your mind. On raising the bar on certified certificates, Parfin Herb says, but in Nigeria, the cost or penalty of doing the wrong thing is often cheaper than doing the right thing. Take, for example, basic traffic infraction, running into tens of thousands, if paid directly to the government, is so insignificant it's so that it's often cheaper to pay a bribe to the un underpaid enforcement personnel. You have a point, my brother. On sexual offenses, Sevik says, I have spoken about this severally. Gender-based violence is a reality in our society. We must rehabilitate and punish victims and perpetrators of rape. Thank you for joining your voices to us and that of her treasure, her sister here. On Africa Wakanda complex, our viewers continue to lift our spirits. Phantom 2K10 says, this channel is greatly underappreciated and underrated. I agree with you. But we are still grateful for this platform and we, you great people behind it. We hear you, Phantom. Shout it out there for people at the back to hear. In the meantime, keep your conversation coming on our social media platform, on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, simply go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. And after the break, Balaho speaks to poor men and empty mansions. I can't wait to hear. Me too. <laughs> five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they would like. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Surely, uh, greed is a form of madness since it results in gathering far more that can be put to use. Greedy accumulation. Ever heard of the cement Amada before? If you have not, you should read about it. It was a 1974 scandal of monumental proportion in which Nigerian government officials ordered 20 million tons of cement to be delivered within 12 months. At the rate of 1.6 tons a month, the shipments were more than twice the unloading capacity of all Nigerian ports combined. It set the tone for a discussion on the greedy accumulation of useless wealth by Nigerians. About a decade ago, a bank CEO in Nigeria forfeited 104 properties to the government. Choice properties are choice locations in Lagos, Dubai, and America. I've been unable to wrap my head around why anybody needs the owner of four properties that are mostly locked up of what use are these properties. I'm sure you have seen the video of a property set to belong to the former chairman of a political party in Nigeria. It's not as if the owner will bring all the people from his village to come and live there. How many children does he have? Some of the children might be women who will get married and go live with their husbands. And maybe the sons don't even live in Nigeria. The owner of the property himself lives in Abuja. So, who are the real occupants of this edifice? As with similar ones, domestic servants and security men. The most recent one was another humongous property said to be on 48 plots of land, somewhere in one of the major cities in the southwest Nigeria. How many people are expected to live on this 48 plot property? Will all the children live there with the parents forever? So at the end of the day, it will be a house with two or three owner-linked occupants, and the rest will be domestic servants and security men. 
There are beautiful, unoccupied houses in choice parts of Lagos and Abuja. And some of these have been unoccupied for years. We also have similar properties owned by Nigerians across the world. The owners live in Nigeria, and the properties are unoccupied in foreign lands for years. Typically, the people you see in these buildings are the security men. Some people have said that these real estates are used to store proceeds of ill-gotten wealth. Otherwise, which same investor would develop or acquire properties and have them unoccupied for years? Julius Rosenwald, a Jew, was major shareholder and president of Sears Corporation in the US. He believed education was important to economic and social advancement, and that the blacks in the US were not being educated. Black schools were inadequate and deplorable. He financed the building of 5,295 schools to enhance the education of the blacks in America. It wasn't even a black. My advocacy is that the Nigerian elite and political class, the wealthy, should start to rethink their approaches to how they deploy the wealth they acquire. There is no much benefit to our world in acquiring humongous real estate that are really likely useless and unoccupied in the midst of aversive needs all around us. Who does the house on 48 plus help? When we hear those world wealth rankings, the wealth of these people on the list is mostly tied up in the value of stock they hold in productive companies and assets. They are value creators, employers, wealth builders, and not mere owners of private empty real estate. We need to review our ways. Yes, certainly. We, we truly need to review our ways. And uh, certainly. in reviewing my ways also, um, in your advocacy, you left out the gaps. I will fill in the gaps. <laughs> Cecilia Ibru was a lady who's uh, uh, the CEO, who was uh, about 194 properties were recovered from. Okay. Oshomole is the one with the mansion, the former uh, chairman of a political party he referred to with a mansion in Iyamo. <laughs> Ajumobi is the late um, mm -hmm. former governor of your state, uh, of Oyo state who built a house plots. in a 48 plot. It is the same everywhere. I have, uh, recently, the current minister for state for petroleum, um, oh, uh, no. Siva, mm -hmm. you remember he had issues with the FCC, but the moment he joined uh, the party that does not sin, his 49 oh, yes, houses, sins were his, on, his sins were forgiven, his yeah. 49 houses were returned to him. And then you will now begin to wonder why was, what would somebody want to do with all of these many with houses? That some of them, houses. they won't forget that they own these houses. Oh, because these people don't think. All they think about is primitive ac accumulation. Just imagine the money spent in building those houses. If you go to your village, or your local government and you decide to build, you know, renovate schools. You build houses for the vulnerable, like two-two bedroom, you know, like Egbenedio used to do. Mm. In Singapore, you have more people than the number of houses. So at the end of the day, you won't have a situation where somebody will want to rent two bedroom for you, or if, if a small kitchen called a room, a self-contained for you in VI, for 700,000 or 500,000 because it's in VI, because there'll be enough. But when you continually, prim primitively acquire this wealth yeah. and we refuse to name and shame yes, them, yes. then they would continue. And then to, 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 they, they, to round up, yeah. like Ekene always says, let us look out for the right people to push them in there so that we will now begin to have you know, people, you know, the worst, best of us or the good of us ruling the best of us. Warren Buffett is one of the most wealthy, the, one of the wealthiest men in this world. He's still living in the same apartment, I hear, that he'd always lived in. The same thing with um, uh, Microsoft. Uh, so uh, what yeah. is this thing, this obsession with huge houses? Uh, Balaho said uh, domestic servants and security aides end up living it. in them. No. I think they end up with birds, rodents, and lizards yeah, exactly. at the end exactly. of the day. Exactly. You know, because it's just useless. Mm. As he, Balawa rightly said, the sons probably are abroad. They'll yeah. never yes. come for such yeah. huge stuff. The girls or the ladies, they're going to get married and move on with their lives. So who exactly do you want to leave 48 plus of land for? I mean, I, I want to tag who it on Who do you to... want to 
what, which of your children will inherit 49 buildings? I want to tag it on to Libra, Libra's so to um, advocacy because he's talking about EFCC. But it's clear that the people who are looting, you can see it is all around us. That's why he can name Oshomole, Ajimobi. Yeah, so why is EFCC acting like they're, they're looking for who is, <laughs> who is looting? <laughs> but like, for example, somewhere in Enugu, when I, we were looking and saying, oh, let's investigate maybe buying some land, we came across a massive plot of land. So this is Obasan that he owns this kind of massive plot of land all around states in Nigeria. And you still say, oh, well, at least he's doing something for the country. No, you shouldn't tolerate. It shouldn't be open knowledge that people have these plots of land that are ex and in, excess of, away. In, in excess of what they earn. And you don't hold people. them accountable. That's why the name and shame is important. Yeah. You know? uh, and I'm glad Libra's plugged in the ga gaps because it mustn't mm. be left gaping like yeah. that. We must be able to say. And so I'm thinking to myself, the only way you're going to dissuade people from being so... What's the word? It, it's gluttony, it, it's yes. obsessive, it, there's something very, yeah. it's a form of madness, really. It is. It's, it's to insane. name and shame them, to film these lands, yeah. title them, put them on social, the same social media they're trying to clamp us yes. on. Yes, yeah. you and, see? And, and have them answer to it, because we are asking, how come you have these plots of land? How come you're not putting it where it ought to be? Because the money belongs to us. There's no way. You, and that's the problem. That's why, that's the, really, uh, to land it here, because Ruki, I must hear you, um, that's why they're not able to deploy the wealth properly, because it was ill-gotten wealth. If, you, yeah. if you're a sensible man that works hard for your money, you'll be careful how you spend it. Our society Rookie. must get to a point where we question it, sudden it, it's, wealth. It's, it's, really, it's really not right. Rookie, please. It's Rookie. very, very interesting that what uh, Golan had to say because it's not it's not only politicians. I've, I'm sure you heard of Posh Party yeah, recently yeah, right. and all these um, fast cash people who no one asked them, how did you get this wealth? How is it possible that you can afford this holding a, a government office or you know, suddenly from, oh, from rags advanced. to riches. Yeah. So society also is to blame because when you go and do a huge um, donation in the church and everyone prays for you and then no one asks you what's really going on. <laughs> and why would any community sell such a huge plot of land to an individual that's not building a factory? I mean, the, the, <laughs> the um, kings and whoever landowners have that's to get true. wiser also. You know, what are you doing to improve the quality of your community? Where are the schools? Where are the roads? There's no electricity. There's no running water to even flush toilets or even drink. And so you use all this wasted money. And by the way, buildings don't maintain themselves. I have a house. You know what it costs to maintain a house annually. And you have several of these just littering the whole place. No one's, you know. So, I mean, the whole thing really makes me sick to my it stomach. Does, and yeah. it's really a Nigerian thing because really all over the world, this is not like that. People have properties. It's true. It's an investment. You have short lets. You have long lets. It makes money for you, and you are employ staff as a result of that. Not just build huge, you know, monstrosities. Just, you know, I mean, anyways, let me stop here. I know this is a time <laughs> issue, but we are all on the same page. Yeah, so, so we need to hold them to account. We need to name and shame. I think that's the only way forward on this one. Wallaho has pointed to a perverse mindset. After the break, I'm saying right action goes beyond a mindset. Keep watching. A wrong diagnosis will inevitably lead to a misapplied cure. I'll be talking about colonial mentality or failure that can't be whitewashed. A friend recently wrote about how the obsession with wanting to associate with things Western and even white, from skin color to accent, smacked of a colonial mentality. Mm, I'm not so sure. The colonial masters left over 60 years ago, during which time we've managed to further ransack our country from within and we blame our unpopularity and pariah status on a colonial mindset? Take our healthcare sector. It is so dilapidated and bereft of investment, even down to the protective garments needed during a pandemic. Many would avoid taking a gamble on it if they could, except that now they can't, they're left with no choice. Yet we say we look down on Nigerian train because of a colonial mentality. We can't whitewash failure just as you cannot package success. Hush Poppy is a recent witness to this. Without fundamental investment, we will continue to speak of potential and not substance, like a balloon filled with air. Success cannot be founded solely on a mindset. Individually and collectively, we need to demand excellence of ourselves, our businesses, our government, simultaneously, no passing the buck. Without investing what little we have in ourselves today, we cannot expect to see value tomorrow. We cannot expect people to want to associate with us since failure has no friends. However, the good news is failure isn't written into our DNA. Our music and entertainment industry, for example, is flourishing 
and internationally coveted, despite our poor achievements in almost all other sectors. This should tell us it was never an intrinsic black versus white thing. Ikoro Du Bois can attest to this. It is actually more straightforward than we have made it. If we do well, then as a nation, Nigeria will be the measure of success. Africa, the image of resplendence, and black will be beautiful indeed. And black still, will be beautiful. We're beautiful already. It's still yeah, colonial but we won't mentality. We'll have to fight yeah. Black Lives Matter. It is still colonial mentality. Okay, help me. Um, we like me, everything foreign. I'm it's telling not you. Foreign. Nobody's that's why, looking your way. Don't worry, that's carry why, on. That's why even you look at look at Indian and um, Nigeria, for example, they were colonized almost at the same time, gained independence, you know, a few years apart. Look at Ghana, even Ghana. Ghana has been able to retain its originality. Do you know that this music that you think that is coveted abroad, Congo music, is coveted abroad more, much more than this Nigerian music because of its originality? As you because of his originality, because of his originality, okay. well, maybe we're saying the same thing. Then. But ours is the fact that oh, you want to talk like an American, yo, hey, two fingers in the air, peace, and then, and so that American is looking for something that is African, and not something that is American African. He's not looking for you to be gorgeous. Exactly, and so it's the same thing, and that's why, rather than we talk about mansions. Rather than look inward, how do I develop? The first thing you want to do is, I have money, I've been local government chairman, I want to visit America. You're not thinking of bringing America to your local government, just the way Dubai brought the West to them. So, yeah. so and it is still that mentality of the West is better. So let me go there and you get there, the next thing, oh, I wish I could just own a property here. Rather than owning but, but that Libra, property. Sorry to interject, but do you not think that the West is better because the West is better? That's what I'm saying. If no. the West were not better, why would you convert it? As no. I'm saying, get no. it right. No. The, the West has their own time in what the past when they saying, worked at being better. That's yeah, what yeah, I'm, I'm saying. saying yeah, that the, 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 it is that mentality of you thinking that the West is better. There are African... You said, indeed, we, African is black, or how do you... Black, black would be beautiful indeed. Black would be, be already beautiful. beautiful. Black is already beautiful. It is for you to see the beauty in it and enhance it. it, it you know, um, excellence is difficult and tough to find. We, as Africans, have not done enough in the space of excellence. We don't hold our own feet to the fire. And therefore, the outputs has not been earning us any respect anywhere. And in spite of the flaws that you're going to see with, with the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter, we need to invest more in ourselves. The blame game doesn't work any longer. So it's only going to be blamed for the reason why our hospitals are not equipped or our curriculum have not been revised or there are no school uh, uh, infrastructure for the children to attend. We can't blame with people for all of that now. They left a long time ago. So we must invest in excellence if we're going to reap any fruit of excellence. I think Bolaho gets me. Can That's I, not my point. Yeah. Okay, so my own feeling about this is a little bit different because um, even recently you had um, um, the president's candidate, Pendisha Kade, in the United States election, said her position was a Nigerian. I'm talking about in the health sector. So when, we, when Nigerians leave um, Nigeria, uh, they can excel in all works of life, even NASA and we, we find the, the highest um, sad scores of sometimes Nigerians. You wonder what's really happening to bright minds um, excelling elsewhere, and Nigeria is the way it is. And we're going back to the same topic that we're all hovering about. It's, it's about corruption. Why don't we have electricity? You're talking about Ghana. I remember in my lifetime, in the 80s, we were talking about Ghana must go. People were coming to do menial jobs, tailors, houseboys, or whatever, just to survive. And today, the last time I went to Ghana, the, the hotel that I stayed in, it was as if I was in New York. It was the same cost. So what's wrong with us in Nigeria? Why are we not excelling and let it be visible? Because we have, we have so many hidden shadows, so many mysterious things, because we want to, to enhance corruption. So that, for me, is the bottom line. Until we can hold our leaders and our systems accountable, how can we excel, no matter how brilliant we are?
because we're excelling elsewhere. Is it a different brain that entered my head because I came to Canada or to United States or to London? It's the same person. It's just because the system here works. Let's jump in. It's a colonial mentality that leads to that failure. Right. I can I, I, I say said, and first. I quote, can I said, and I quote, you can't whitewash failure mm. and you can't package success. Yes. See what happens in our sports. We would wait for a name to be made, a Nigerian name to be made abroad. Then we import them to use them for the various competitions. We're not investing in But we're not people. growing. Yeah. We don't have homegrown people. Well, you're yeah. making the and same point I'm making. Yeah. What we are saying it's is... It's still it the same It is that colonial thing. mentality that leads to <laughs> failure. Yeah, that's okay. what so she what said. Is that's wrong what we are with saying. Why you finish that? What is I'm wrong with us? I remember... Why did I set up uh, the Funke Treasure Table Tennis Championship? Because I saw that there were no Bose Kafos and the Funke or Shonaike anymore. Mm. Yes, we have other people coming but you know no really big names anymore and then i looked at what we had the structure that we had not nothing significant we just take from here from there and then tomorrow when we hear that a certain somebody is making waves in table tennis then we go and pluck that person to say come and run no, no, and, and your sponsors we only support when you now go to bring some people and abroad as yes. part no, of maybe, that Let me treasure. Let me treasure. Where we may be missing ourselves. I think you're saying what I'm saying, but maybe thing. we're missing ourselves is to say, you are importing the person because that person has gone to an environment where they, that person has been invested in. Right. So you're rightly importing them because they're the real deal. But you can't take your homegrown because they haven't been invested in. So it's not just colonial, it's substance. You're going after the substance. People associate um, quality, like Apple, because they are substance. Yeah, they have a brand. Have, we, we haven't have developed that brand. No, Do you we know have substance can't people can brag on something that no, is not there. We have substance right. at home. They're not just you recognized know, because they have not gone abroad. Sorry, Rookie. Rookie. An operation can be going on and they take light and then every, the, the patient dies. The time they switch over to the gen, for example, something that is a very simple procedure gets complicated because of two or three minutes of a switchover. Just simple things like yes, that yes. makes us very, you know, below the par. Yeah. So people don't want to, to go there. Like you want to have a routine surgery. Most people that can afford it go abroad. Some people even go to India. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Because we cannot have basic infrastructure that we can rely on. So what I'm saying and is that this the, is yeah, the fundamental the problem in Nigeria. There, that no... I am colonial mentality may not always What's be just reason? colonial mentality. Yeah. What, what are they doing that we should actually copy and what the, should we do to strengthen our system? I, I think you, you, you seem to be missing the point that Rookie and I, um, Treasure, Treasure and I are okay. making. It is simple. That man who refused to invest in Nigeria, okay. his reason for refusing to invest in Nigeria is that, oh yes, somebody has invested abroad. Okay, you know, it's already made. Already made one. Already made. Mm -hmm. It's a colonial mentality thing. You know, when the white came, why were they able to colonize us? Because we felt that they were already no, made. No. They were superior. <laughs> it's they not came with. colonial mentality that makes no, you invest abroad. No, no, wait, seriously. It's because it's easier and it's no. more. It's, more, it's no. ready to no. go. It's, for it's our the government first officials. To be a okay, for our government officials. officials. Fine. For our government officials who are saddled with the responsibility to make it right. Yes. Their reason for not making it they right rather go is abroad they would rather go to where yes. they believe that man that left them long ago is still superior to them. Oh, okay. Fine, and okay. So that's what leading to all of those failures. Okay, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, I think, I I think we saw it the in the end. management of COVID-19 as well. The moment the, the people in the West were locking down, we started locking down. Okay. Okay, fine. And then now that they've started easing out, then we started <laughs> easing out. Like, Whether it applies I'm, to us or not. I'm glad we had that conversation because I think I started getting your angle towards the end. Okay, after we've offered up our keys to success, it's over to you and all of us to unlock it. So keep the conversation going on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocates NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocates NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week when we'll be tabling more hot and spicy topics for you to chew on, let's keep advocating for a better society. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Ah, you guys have a Bye. great day. My <laughs> seeing you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely.
and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.